Hi there, welcome to the second or another episode in the series of interviews for dog owners to help them discover the secret of dog experts that will transform their bond and create the relationship with their dog that they've always wanted. Today, I have Kamal Fernandez. He is an amazing dog trainer. He's been a trainer for I think well over 25 years. For, and is known for his very special ability to work with aggressive um, dogs and dog training. And known he is known internationally um, as a presenter and a speaker, and even been involved in film and uh, television with his own dogs. And um, now you have your Fernandez, Kamal Fernandez online uh, dog training school, which is great teaching. I understand you do teaching, teaching and consults for behavior issues. Uh, ranging from everything from overwhelm to new dog to actually championship professional sport dogs, which is awesome. Um, I really thank you so much for coming today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Um, it's always nice to do these things. And, you know, the internet allows us to talk to people across the globe. So it's really, really I'm really, really um, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yes, yes, I appreciate that. And I appreciate, um, you know, especially your expertise in, the, in aggression. But first of all, I would love to know, I, I do, I loved your story. I mentioned already about, about your first dog, which yep. um, so many people get a dog and it's just not at all what they thought it would be and, and kind of get stumped and stuck and not sure what to do. And, and um, I understand you kind of were in a situation, you were in a situation like that and I'd love to hear your story. Yeah. So I think, you know, my journey into dog ownership was very similar to probably 95 of the percent of the people that we we deal with I suspect as professionals in that I was you know an avid dog lover I had a, a, a deep passion still do for dogs of all shapes and sizes and I uh, you know was a relentless child and I'm, and I'm a relentless person so I badgered my ch parents to uh, get me a dog and what actually happened was um, we actually got a we used to live in Australia and we got our first actual ever dog in Australia and what happened with her was we went to the local RSPCA and got um, a, a, she was the Kelpie German Shepherd Cross. And she was one of those dogs that was put on this earth to be obedient. She just knew stuff that there was no way in God's good name that we taught her. Like, you know, my my resident, the local expert was the person across the road um, who happened to own a dog. That was the benchmark of uh, expertise that we had. And, you know, the first day we got her, they said, you know, let's take the dog out for a walk. We didn't have a lead or a collar. And then, oh, she'll be fine. She'll just walk by your side. And sure as egg, she did. And she was only about 10 or 12 weeks old. And they said, well, you know, we stopped at a curb. She sat next to us. This was an untrained dog. This was a 10-week-old puppy. Um, and she was just one of those dogs. Um, and um, what happened, unfortunately, was my dad you, um, got a job back in the UK. He was offered a job opportunity back in the UK. And we had to emigrate back to the UK. So we'd been in Australia for a couple of years. Um, and he was offered a job. And at that time, you know, it was financially not viable for us to put her in kennels for six months um, and through quarantine, um, because at the time that we had her and the financial implications of doing it was just not realistic at that time. And it was absolutely gut wrenching. But you know, at the time, it was, you know, the most devastating thing that happened. But the ironic thing is, everything happens for a reason. And um, when we came to the UK, again, I was on my parents that they, you know, can I have a dog? And the dog that landed in my lap was um, a little chow chow cross uh, called Scrunch, who was the dog that started this journey into dog training. And I, I look back and think of that experience with the first dog, the first uh, dog's name is Dusky versus Scrunch. And I, I solemnly believe that if I had Dusky and we didn't come back, to, I'm not sure I would be a dog trainer now because she was just such a brilliant little dog. You know, she would she was just a naturally well-behaved dog. Um, whereas Scrunch was a like, satan in a brown coat i used to call her you know she had every behavioral problem you know known to man she used to but then i look back in truth and it was all created by my inexperience and my ineptitude as a you know um a inexperienced first time dog owner i was nine years old um so she had resource guarding she didn't have a recall she used to run off she had separation anxiety that um she had um you know loads of other challenges you couldn't handle her you couldn't look in her ears you couldn't do any basic husbandry the only thing in her favor that she had is that she wasn't aggressive with dogs um and she generally wasn't aggressive with people 
unless you try to take something off her or you try to look in her teeth or her ears or anything like that, then she would turn into Cujo. But, um, you know, she was the dog that essentially started me on this journey. And I'm forever grateful for the lessons that she um, that she created and caused. It's pretty, it's pretty, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. So how did you, you know, did you, you know, you, so did you started, because you must, you were learned, I forget what I read, you actually like Susan Garrett, I think, and people. Yeah, so at that time, start- not so much. So this was, oh God, this was, well, 30 years ago, 30, more than that, 31 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, about 30 years ago now. And um, at that time, the training was much more uh, based on punishment. It was check chain. So the first night I walked in dog training, class I was taught how to put a check chain on and you know the, you, had to, you, you put it on your wrist and you were taught how to, it worked etc and I was bearing when I was nine years old so I, I was a child in and I was the person that was training the dog my parents weren't involved so I was the child responsible for training the dog with a check chain you can rem- imagine you know how that worked out and you know full credit to the dog and that she I'm going to use the word endured my ineptitude and managed to muddle through you know um and the first night we we actually um partook in a class we literally did the whole you know 45 minutes or an hour and we walked around the hall square bashing for you know it was always the same part i could probably recite the routine and we did that every single night from you know when it's like when i started to when i um moved on from the club um or the class i should say and um we essentially we were just thrown in the deep end and at that time you know the the use of food and reinforcement for training was very much frowned upon so if you used food i remember a, a distinct incidence where um when i was a bit several years into my dog training journey at that point she got a real aversion to going to the class because one of the other trainers there one of the other people um, used to train her dog um, and, and he when he was doing heel work or healing used to go forward so what she used to do is get a really a, a, a check chain and it was balled up in a, a tied up in a ball and she'd throw it on the floor well this not it was the idea being that the dog would be cons- like not want to go forward and then, again you know there's so many pitfalls with that as a method but let's not go there but what it did to my dog was it it really scared her so she heard this and and the hall that has I mean ironically I went and trained in that hall for several years when I started on my business actually, but it's got really, really um, high ceilings. So the acoustics, so it just reverberated around the whole building. So for her, it was like there was a thunderstorm and she didn't like thunderstorms every single week. Now that dog became so fearful of going to um, class that she wouldn't, so our ritual for going to class was I would get picked up by one the person that used to run the class. And I used to go across the road, go over, uh, not a bridge, but over a, um, a set of stairs down to meet her to the other side. That dog back chained going over those stairs into that vehicle and she wouldn't get at one point. And she knew the time when we're likely to go dog club because she associated that ritual of going over the stairs, we'd go in the van, she'd go to hall, she'd get scared. She stopped, avoid, she avoided going in the um, um, the uh, stairs, up the stairs. That's how bad it was. So very, obviously- yeah. They really yeah. tell you quite clearly when it's Absolutely. not, they don't yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was told by people, you know, oh, she'll be fine, she'll get over it, etc. And she didn't. And I really had to think, you know, I was essentially, I would go to classes and that dog would stay in the vehicle for the whole night. She would not get out of the vehicle. And it was, I was, you know, super enthusiastic about training. And I was looking at it from, at that point, if I'm truthful, I didn't consider, you know, it from a, um, um, the way in which I don't look, I didn't look at it from the way in which I would now. I looked at it as, I can't do anything with this dog. I can't train her. She's so frightened. And I knew that this wasn't what I wanted my dog to be like. Um, and I didn't really understand how to, at that point, I didn't have the information, but I just acted instinctively. And I, she, um, what I used to do was used to sneak um, food into classes with her. So I used to take some cheese and my dad's cheese, my dad's mild cheddar cheese that he used to like to, to eat. And I used to, she used to have this really crap dog food it was um had had um a, a food we used to call we called um uh value mix and it was a real cheap like, awful awful food bless that dog's heart and uh, but there was meat nuggets in it which she loved those meat nuggets so i used to take all the meat nuggets <laughs> collect them in a bag with some cheese and that used to be my secret stash that i used to take to training and what how i got that dog over that was by getting the person to feed her um and and conditioned her counter conditioned her in that environment so i would only ever give her the cheese 
nugget combo at class to get rid of it. And she, to be fair, it worked. And I don't know, how, like at that time I hadn't, I didn't know why it worked, but I just thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. I knew that she liked this cheese and this nuggets. And I thought, well, you know, I know that it's going to be frowned on, but I've got, I've got to go do something. So that was, she was, again, it was such a, um, you know, I had no, nobody you stumbled, guiding. You stumbled, you stumbled across something there yeah, that you I didn't even across. realize. And that's why I really do encourage a lot of trainers to don't be afraid to try things that you allow your instincts sometimes to guide you. Because whilst, I mean, I had no um, technical knowledge at that point of training. It was just pure instinct. And then I was very, uh, as my career, um, you know, uh, progressed and um, my passion for dog training grew and I got my first proper obedience dog. I was lucky to be taken under the wind of a very prominent trainer at the time. Um, and she really befriended me and uh, guided me and mentored me. Uh, and she was very much about using motivational methodologies. She was more traditional. She would call her a balanced trainer, but she was very good at what she did. And she's, I mean, she's still, uh, you know, she's a phenomenal dog trainer, a lady called Sylvia Bishop, who um, at that time was absolutely, you know, the top of her game. And she saw something in me that and recognized that I had an aptitude and a talent for training dogs. And to be fair, she sparked and she allowed that to grow and develop. And um, and it just really snowballed. And then, uh, you know, my because of my journey with that dog and the, the subsequent other, the dog after that followed her, um, who was the dog that I went on to compete at crafts, et cetera, with, um, both those dogs really got me thinking about how do I want to train my dogs? What methods do I want to use? Do I want to be doing this to my dog in the name of a sport? Or do I want to be doing this with my dog in the name of, um, you know, getting it to sit or getting it to down? So I had this, you know, huge, um, and, it, and it was, again, it's funny how life works. At the time, you know, I was in my teens, I was at college and I was studying um, psychology. And um, we did a whole, uh, you know, about uh, um, cognitive, uh, sorry, um, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, behaviorism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we did that as a whole module. And there was so, by learning that stuff, I can remember looking, reading the book um, uh, uh, related to the topic. And I, it was just like all these light bulbs were going off. I was like, oh my God, this is how, this is, this is it. This is the, and then, it, then I actively sought out, you know, people that could help me and guide me and, and um, you know, um, I stumbled on uh, across Susan Garrett. This is when she started to um, become prominent when she first launched Recallers. And it was the beginning of, I suppose, online dog training in that form. Um, and then I'd, I'd already by that point discovered um, Bob Bailey, um, Karen Pryor, um, people of that ilk. So, um, and I just immersed myself in that world and it allowed me to really, you know, broaden my perspective and, you know, change my outlook on dog training full stop. No, it's, I, I, I really feel like I was a nurse before, right. before this life, before this part of my life and, and um, for 24 years. And I really, I just feel like I got involved in dog training at such a good time because yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, <clears throat> excuse me, I just, I remember the things that we did yeah. to my, you know, and we had dogs that we got, you know, got rid of, right. Yeah. Because, because they were biting or we, we didn't know what we were doing. And there was dog trainer was never a word, you know, yeah. um, and yeah, it's, it's so exciting now. And I love, you know, all the positive and, and we're learning so much more. There's becoming even so much more respect for the body language and, and actually really looking at the dog and, and, yeah. and um, seeing everything that they're seeing and about them. It's amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think to be, so I, I that I think that, so when we were using averses and compuls compulsion, we did actually observe the dog's body language because to be f not, this is not um, supporting those methods. It's just, if you're gonna use aversives, you have to be able to read the dog so that you know how much um, pressure to apply, how much pressure to remove. So whilst I'm, I, I wouldn't train my dogs like that now, the irony is I'm thankful of the path that I took because it allowed me to see another way of training and have more compassion to people that don't necessarily train that way now. Um, so I, you know, I always believe in keeping the dialogue and the conversation open, but it also actually made me a better dog trainer because you have to be able to read dogs and read their nuances of behavior if you're using pressure or aversives because too much could destroy the dog and, and you know, not enough could be ineffective, so to speak. 
Um, and so you actually refine your ability to read dogs. What you do with the information, you might go, well, he's, he's, he's stressed, but never mind. He has to get on with it and push the dog through it. My take now would be different. I would go, okay, do you know what? I can think my way around this now. I can, I can reduce the distraction. I can change the environment. There's so many things that I have in my, uh, at my disposal that I can uh, manipulate to create a better learning experience, which I would have said the dog trainer of old wouldn't have been quite so compassionate, I would have said would be the word. Yeah, it's true. And and it's and I love like, I mean, every dog teaches yep. me something and 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 just learning and understanding and and pressure. Pressure is a big thing that um I've been talking about lately, you know, mm -hmm. with a few people and just understanding the pressure point of your dog and and getting and helping others to understand it, like to see yep. it. Because sometimes people will even say it to me you know, the dog was this the first time and then that the second time. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Okay. So what did you see the first time? That's, that's your yeah. pressure point right there already. And, yeah. and it's really um, awesome helping people to, to, to learn that. Yeah. And, you know, to not make the mistakes that I've made, you know, like you think of the, 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 the effect or, or the fallout of having a nine-year-old child with a check chain with an untrained dog. You think that is, like that is a recipe for disaster or it's a recipe for, um, you know, the dog being uh, corrected badly or, uh, you know, uh, essentially been punished for. And whilst I, I look back and cringe, I, I, don't, I, I am thankful and trying to be positive, but I'm thankful for the path that I took because it has brought me to this moment. And I solemnly believe everything happens as it's meant to. Well, and we can only um, do with what we know. Absolutely, We're absolutely. Going with the time, yeah. Absolutely, and that's why I think you know. Um, uh, there's been a lot of recent discussions about you know um, creating a dialogue between those of us that use reinforcement-based methodologies and those that use more balanced and a balanced approach. Because having been in that world, you know, I, I didn't believe, I didn't know that I was doing what I was doing was was wrong or or could be done better. And when I know better, you do better. And I think unless you keep that conversation going, you end up ostracizing people from the conversation because I was that person at one point. And if people hadn't, you know, extended, um, you know, uh, an olive branch, so to speak, to me, I would have never, have, um, you know, do what I do now. Um, so I think it's th that's something to be taken from the conversation anyway. For sure, yes. That you know, th there's so many ways and. and just just doing the you know the best whatever way thing you need to yeah. do for the dog and and yes i agree there's lots of different ways and, and just even the word positive reinforcement can bring up some very interesting conversations among dog people and and i find it very interesting to talk about that like to yeah. to get the opinions and and my eyes have opened up in many ways different ways already just from all <clears throat> excuse me from my conversations with experts like you i love it it's yeah. it's great and i'm hoping to help people yeah. um what else? I wanted to see about helping, because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, we both mentioned and talked about people create aggression, because mm -hmm. so many people really seem to think that they should be able to take something out of their dog's mouth anytime. Mm -hmm. And I know my first thought to say is, like, I just simple thing is my shoes, right? I'd be really pretty pissed off if somebody was always taking my shoe from me yeah. so yeah. I mean every dog has a limit and everybody's different but I'd love to see how you know how you explain it and what you think about that and the label aggression yeah Is so that, oh, I mean again that's a, we could be here for hours talking I know. about that so I think you know oh, yeah. the, the response of um, my take on aggression or the term aggression aggression is a symptom of an underlying issue it's not the it's not the 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 core root of the problem and it's often because the dog have, feels that it has no other option than it resorts to or re, uh, yeah reverts to or resorts to using aggression to make its point heard some dogs do that quicker than others yeah so certain breeds of dogs um because we've been genetically selected them to be aggressive or to show aggression or ag aggression is part of who they are those dogs might have a shorter um, fuse or a, a lower threshold to uh, uh, reaching that point where they um, refer to aggression. But aggression in terms of how we engage with our dogs, in my experience, the vast majority of um, instances of aggression 
can be avoided, managed or deterred or dealt with much more effectively if we just take a minute and rather than rushing in there with our size tens and making um, uneducated, uninformed decisions. Uh, it, now, this isn't talking about in the heat of the moment, the dog is doing something, it's going to bite a small child. In that moment, do whatever you need to do, pick it up, grab it, you know, whatever, you know, rugby tackle it to the ground so that safety will prevail. But once you've resumed normalcy, then go back and go, okay, how can I educate this dog? How can I teach this dog to cope in that situation? Now, the, 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 the term aggressive aggression is, in my opinion, just slapped on like reactivity is slapped on um, to to describe everything from the dog that's fearful to the dog that's resource guarding to the dog that's um, in pain and, and, and is trying to show you that it's in pain. All those things um, uh, that people slap the label on as uh, aggressive, aggressive. And therefore, we aren't actually dealing with the core root of the problem, which for example, the dog that's in pain and when you, you know, a kid chimes on its back yeah, and it retaliates, let's see if we can give the dog some medication to get ease the pain. Let's see if we can make the dog more comfortable. Let's look at alternative, you know, if the dog has back end pain, let's do some hydrotherapy, let's do some acupuncture, et cetera, et cetera, to help the dog be safer in a situation um, where it may be triggered. Um, my frustration with aggression is that, you know, and part of my career was I worked in, um, um, in kennels that dealt with a lot of dogs that were seized by the police that were going to essentially involve in court cases and going to be euthanized. And some of them were from um, dog fighting. That was, but this was uh, in the mid nineties. So some of them were for, for dog fighting um, and they had been essentially their aggressive traits had been drawn out or utilized for, you know, dog fighting. Other dogs had been mismanaged and had were out of control essentially so uh, and and hadn't been trained and hadn't been edu educated and they had uh, acted in a way that was deemed to be aggressive but actually when you read the case studies about them you go this is just a it might be an unruly dog it might be an edu uneducated dog it might do be a dog with poor social skills but when you interact with them on the day-to-day -day basis and they were the most docile dogs you go this is dog is a victim of lack of understanding, mismanagement, poor education. And I, the, the thing that I constantly um, draw on is, it's no different to children, that if you, children that resort to acts of violence or crime are often a product of environments, um, circumstances, um, contributing factors that cause them to act in a way that is deemed to be inappropriate, illegal, harmful, etc. But actually when you strip it back, there's always, you know, there's always a, a, um, a, an accumulative factor to, to their, the resulting action. And I believe the same of the dog, dogs. Yeah, yes. It's, it's always, it's something there's, there's, and learning to figure, you know, to what it is and not just labeling them, yeah. you know, yeah. is, is yeah. just so important and, and yeah. wow. Yeah, you've had, that's interesting working in those years in the, in yeah. that kind of it was, a place. It was a really, really, really fruitful experience because it was handling dogs on mass, you know, which I think anybody in a professional term should be a, should be get their hands dirty and handle dogs. So we had boarding dogs, we had dogs in for residential training, we had the seized dogs, we had um, RSPCA cases, we had a whole spectrum at that kennel. And um, it was a great uh, experience for somebody that was green into dog uh, into this world of dogs etc um of just being immersed daily with dogs 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 and having to handle them feel them get a sense of them okay so that dog doesn't like this don't touch that dog's bowl that dog doesn't like this food that dog needs to put weight on that dog need lax condition that dog's a bit quiet today he hasn't eaten his food da, da, da. all those things that you just learn to observe in a, a it's like you know i call it dog university you're immersed in behavior on a daily basis um and so from my point of view as a and from a professional it was it stood me in good uh, uh, you know it, it held me in good stead um in terms of you know uh, uh, dogs that were aggressive dogs the, the the again the dynamics of dogs watching them they would come in you know Mrs. Smith would turn up with her her little, you know, Bichon, who would be absolutely all over you like a rash. Mrs. Smith would go and leave and go and leave, and that dog would turn into Cujo. And then 
Mr. Smith would turn up with his dog who was baying like a wolf and you take it off down the, the, the to the kennels and be act like an absolute lamb. And you go, how does that work? And then you, you realize that, the, that how influential our behavior is on the dog's behavior. Um, and how if as owners, guardians, caretakers, we have take responsibility of our role in the dog's behavior, we can improve them and therefore give them a fuller life. Absolutely. Yes. And taking responsibility and, you know, it's not a quick fix answer to everything. Absolutely. And it's, Absolutely. it's usually the person that has to learn to understand and, and the dog is waiting for them to. Yeah. <laughs> we say the dog is waiting for them to do this. Definitely. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, that's, I, I agree where I, what I've learned from dogs and it was the same with my nursing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the experience that taught me what I knew really grew it's actually yeah. being there and observing it and experiencing it and and um and dogs it's it's i watch mine i'm encouraging i always encourage videoing right yeah. getting to see what's going on so that they can yeah. see you know if, you, if they think their dog was aggressive like i i even I'm, i don't even know like i'm for sure how much i've said that word today already <laughs> but you know, if there's something that they consider to be aggressive and they, they might be able to video and see what's actually happening before it or, yeah. you know, yeah. keeping an eye and learning the dog and um, and finding ways to, to help them through it. Not, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, even the treat, treats, treats are good, but it's way more than that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah what was else was i gonna say that's so awesome this is great stuff i'm so glad that you came and told me about i know i've got a blank here <laughs> it's okay. i've got um, a blank so i just I'm, yeah i know i my head is just thinking because it's all so yeah. much wonderful information and, and your ways of saying it were you a were you a police officer Yes, yeah, I was a police officer for 11 years in London. Um, I wasn't a dog handler, um, and that was a choice that I made because um, I didn't want to be in a position where the dog is not your, isn't yours, it, it is property of the police. And that was always a situation that I didn't want to be in um, and being vulnerable to, you know, you could be essentially, the dog could be taken off you and, you know, given to allocate to another handler. And I didn't want to be in that position because of the relationship I have with my dogs. And because I trained dogs already prior to joining the police, I, I thought I needed to expand my horizons and do other things, which is what I did. And one of those, as I said, I, I talked about was um, young, working with young offenders. And that was a, a massive learning curve because there was so many parallels um, between young offenders and dog behavior in terms of, you know, um, um, there's correlation certainly with adolescents and because I work with, with teenagers, obviously. Um, and the correlation between problematic behavior in dogs and problematic behavior in children, uh, in, yeah, in young people, young adults, um, and adolescent animals and adolescent um, people. It makes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how, you know, how um, often, you know, people, when uh, I give you a, a, one example of the parallel. So the classic misconception about adolescent dogs is one, the time span that it allows for. People always assume that their dog is, at two years old, their dog has done it. And that's adolescence can vary from anything from six months to three, three and a half years old, depending on the breed, even four with some dogs. And often what people find is when their dog is at that pivotal point, where you where you really need to fall back onto is creating a very strong relationship with that dog because that will not only get you through the the tough times it will mean that the dog draws back to you rather than goes to the environment for um, reinforcement etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, the parallels between has been there's been studies done with people that adolescents are less likely to get into troublesome behavior um, criminality, etc., problematic behavior when they have strong attachments with their um, uh, caregiver or uh, parent, etc. So when they're very bonded with their parent, they're less likely to go and seek, um, uh, you know, a validation from their peers and get into problematic um, situations and so forth and so forth. And that's the same with dogs, I'd say. You know, if you have a really, if you invest in that relationship with your dog you can get through the teenage years with little tiny humps in the road because you will get little bumps because that's natural. But if you don't invest in that relationship, 
and all that happens in the teen years is the dog then it becomes more problematic and everything is amplified and everything is bigger and everything is worse and that's when your dog is likely to display aggressive behavior or problematic behavior or or and that's i would say statistically the highest ratio of dogs that get sent to um rescues um i i think somebody was saying about a recent study about um the the highest percentage of dogs in rescue are adolescent dogs between six months and ten months and you go absolutely you can see because people are over the cute puppy stage the novelty's worn off the pub the dogs now looks like an adult but doesn't behave like an adult and they expect of that dog things that they probably haven't trained educated or informed the dog of you know yeah. oh don't bite the children please don't chase the neighbor's cat don't bite the postman you know please don't eat my leather sofa and so forth and so forth so i think that you know my <laughs> raison d'etre is to educate people so therefore they can affect their dog's life and to to that's why I do what I do in the way that I do you know um social media online etc so that you know um hopefully spread that net of information the more people talk about it candidly and openly and not and dispel the labels of aggression um reactivity and so forth and so forth we can actually look at it for what it is your dog is not a problem child it just is hit a little snag in the right it doesn't you don't have to write that dog off let's just do x y and z and we should see an improvement in the dog's behavior absolutely and that's what you know i really hope to do because our rescues are overflowing yeah. people are adopting dogs and then all and of a sudden, I think, like yeah said, and i think with the lockdown and people going out and getting dogs i think they're gonna we're gonna be i mean the the, the amount of cases that i've had since lockdown is starting to ease in the uk of dogs that have been bought in lock in the beginning of the pandemic and they're naturally going to reach those so you know that the, what i think people are jumping on the bandwagon of oh it's a lockdown puppy actually it's a time factor you know you've now got a dog that's probably you know 10 months 12 months a year that would have been a problematic time irrespective of the dog being in lockdown etc and i think that people are now seeing the um the resulting factor of just having a dog that is now being in the wider world um, and everybody's obviously can let their dogs out they're, they're, there's more people around and the dog's going hang on a second i'm a teenager i would have been a problem i might have had some challenges anyway and now you're exposing me to things that i've not seen in this level of density and intensity um but i think as i say it's it's um the more we talk about it hopefully the more people will understand and yeah. therefore give the dog a, you know, a chance as it were then we can help them you yeah. can help them that's what yeah. we want to do i, I yeah. want to keep i want dogs to stay in their homes yeah and everybody yeah. to be happy you know yeah. i so appreciate your time i know you you have to get away and that's okay could, no problem i could probably go on about this forever that's really good i'm glad i asked i'm glad i remembered to ask you about that in the end because i knew there was a connection with the teenager yeah and because yeah. the dogs yeah there's so many that are teenagers <laughs> but thanks i see i see the connection i love it i thank you so much I'm going to, I'll stop recording. Okay. okay. That's okay, awesome. No Thank you.